everyone, good afternoon. <laughs> so today it's our prayer to have our uh, invited uh, department seminar speaker, Dr. Patrick uh, Cederoni, uh, to be here to join, to be assisted to give uh, this talk. And I know many of you are uh, trying to attend uh, this conference in person. Also, uh, we have a few students online. So the so at the beginning, let me. Uh, make a brief introduction about uh, 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 our VIP speaker. <laughs> Dr. Patrick uh, Caderoni is the National Technical Director of the Advanced Science and Instrumentation Program and uh, uh, the Department of Energy uh, Office of Nuclear Energy. So he also acts as a senior technical advisor for the Idaho National Labs uh, Fusion Safety Program. Dr. Cadroni has more than 20 years experience in the development of vision and fusion energy systems and the testing of nuclear components. In addition to centers, his technical expertise includes molten salt reactors and tritium technology. He holds a bachelor degree in nuclear engineering and has received his PhD and master degrees in mechanical engineering from UCLA. Uh, let's welcome uh, Patrick to give us the talk. So the slides are a bit dry, so I would encourage you to ask questions and be as interactive as possible. So otherwise, I will fall asleep myself while I talk. because we have been around all day. Just for the recording. Speaker. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the first part of the slides relate to the sensor program. The second part is some sort of very easy introduction to fusion. Uh, which I've learned this morning may be of interest. Actually, I was worried that it was just a, a little bit of advertisements on my side. I did not include anything more specific to blankets. Uh, uh, I have an old presentation from the time I was a fusion for energy. I used it actually for doing lectures at Oxford University on fusion materials. Those are 60 slides if you want, I can, <laughs> I can share. Um, so the first we go through the, the program. So I don't think I want to bore you too much with the, the structure of the Office of Nuclear Energy as part of DOE. Um, essentially, this program is part of what they call cross-cutting technology, which means that we are supporting just about everything that DOE NE does. And so those are the three pillars, if you want, supporting to existing reactors. That means uh, essentially modernizing, trying to cost uh, optimize uh, the operation of existing power plants in collaboration, of course, with utilities. So there is the utility parts. Um, we are trying to move away from that space uh, in terms of the sensor instrumentation controls that we, that we provide. We had some discussion this morning with the professors on, for example, operation and maintenance. That's really, there is a big program called Light Water Reactor Sustainability that is very much uh, invested into providing that function to existing plants. And so the ASI program, which I manage, is trying to move away essentially from light water reactors. So most of the things that we are interested in are different coolants and so different temperatures, higher temperature range. So you will see the mantra continuously that is high temperature, high temperature, high temperature because of that reason. So the second group of DOE stakeholders is the advanced reactor companies that are now proposing to design and build now. Uh, and so you have probably heard about uh, a flagstone program that was launched two years ago, three in this making, it's called advanced reactor demonstration. That was an attempt or is an attempt to accelerate the path to, to, to bringing online uh, different type of reactors than the current fleet. The first piece of that is a little modification of LWR, small modular reactor, so just decreasing size, but there's actually a lot of 
uh, different safety features related to SMRs that make them a different class. And that's so if you want, it would sit somewhere in between. Does this have a pointer? That should be yes. a pointer. It would sit in between here, right? This SMR is like new scale. New scale is the most popular one that everyone has heard about. Um, but then there's the advanced reactor. So the advanced reactors up until maybe five years ago used to be the same as saying generation four reactors in the three classic type of reactors, sodium uh, fast reactors and essentially gas cooled reactors and then something else, right? So there was the, the so for example, lead reactors and so forth. So, and the salt reactors started to came back as that third, fourth category. But then micro reactor to, took everyone by surprise, going a lot smaller, you know, being deployed, deployable, tra transportable, and so forth. And, uh, start to make evidence that the cost case was actually there, that there was some reason, uh, and integrating them with a different way to use heat, not only electricity, uh, really brought in the case of for micro reactors. So advanced reactors now involves all of that, and it's really targeting mainly private companies that are putting their own money into the design effort. The last piece, uh, it's a uh, fuel cycle technology. It's really there to say irradiation experiments. So, and that's one important part of the program, an important part of us being here as well, uh, because we are here to discuss the design of an experiment in, the, in our material test reactor at INL, it's called Advanced Test Reactor ATR. So what, what that block is there for is to say that we want to have a justification for also providing instrumentation to irradiation experiment. That's a big part of what we do. Most irradiation experiments are performed in order to qualify new material, new fuel forms. And so that's why it's called fuel cycle technology. Those are everything that NE does and we're supporting everything, which means the program is very scattered, which means that I have to worry about a lot of people complaining or giving me suggestions, giving me priorities and so forth. But uh, that's the so what we're doing here in our mission a statement. You can read it. I'll just go through the mission because that's interesting. Develop advanced sensors, instrumentation, and controls. So that's the discussion we were having this morning. The fact that controls are included. Obviously, when you bring in controls, you bring in a diff very different aspect of what we do that address critical technology gaps for monitoring and controlling existing advanced reactors. So those are the three pieces. So it's the IMC piece, right? That we want to. But importantly, we don't just want to work on, say, feasibility cases for new sensing technology. That's that's we do. Uh, but the important part is that we want to get them to a point in which whoever is the stakeholder, whether it's a program that wants to use this advanced optical fiber to measure their things in ATR, or whether it's their power that wants now to include them in part of their design, that needs to be qualified, validated to a point in which they can take it on without much risk or without the risk involved in an R&D program. So that means that the program needs to do the basic work. That's what you guys do here. And that's how we provide you funds through NUP or other ways. NUP is a, essentially a competitive awarded type of, of projects that are assigned to university. So, but then we also need to push all of that into a, a, a maturation phase, which uh, again, that you'll see later, will include the irradiation test as the means to do that maturation. Maybe more interesting here, when we talk about sensors and instrumentation, or when we talk about INC, we, it, there's a lot of things that, that, that feed from a you know, science and engineering perspective to it. There's the sensor piece, uh, there's modeling in particular in terms of sensor performance. There's material science, obviously, in creating materials that withstand the conditions. Skipping the bottom, there's communication. So whether that's, you know, fiber plays a role, wireless plays a role. There's a lot of the fancy worlds, words, uh, analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence that could contribute, again, either on the, on the data analysis side uh, or on the feeding it to control side. And then there's the advanced control piece. Uh, that's the piece the program is slowly gearing to address. There, we haven't done much work on the control. Again, it's something that is being essentially considered as essential added on, but most of the work so far has been on the sensitive piece. I don't think you care much about 
you know, how the program is engaged and where it collaborates. You'll just see names there, probably. I just thought to keep the slides because it may be interesting to see the breadth in case you want to get involved in any of this. Uh, a lot of international work. I, I know you guys are discussing uh, France. So there normally DOE works with international collaboration on a bilateral uh, stand. It's very difficult for the US to engage in multilateral uh, collaborations. And that's mainly because there are a couple of uh, uh, countries that, that the government does not want to be involved. Once you engage in a multilateral collaboration, you have less control on who basically sits at the table. So it's very limiting, but most of the work we do internationally is done through bilateral collaboration. The confusing part is that most of the times there are many of these bilateral. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but to talk at a table with five different people, persons, you need four uh, different bilateral agreements. Some of them may have different clauses. And so you're talking, you know, only this much and you always have to find essentially the minimum common denominator. What can I say? Frustrating, but uh, that's, that's the way it is. Internally, there's a, a lot of interactions with DOE and others. You're probably all aware of the NRC, which is a, a regulator for, for everything nuclear and the industry standards. Um, there's other EPRIs, it's strange. I don't know if you're familiar with EPRI. It's a private company that does a lot of research. In a sense, EPRI is uh, that chameleon that sometimes acts as a competitor to the labs and sometimes act as a customer or a service uh, according to, to whatever is, of course, is their main interest. Uh, NEI is a, is, a, is a place where all the industry gather, so the Terra Powers and so forth. Uh, well, and then there's work related to NASA. I would like to, but I'm not gonna talk much about the NASA work that we do. Some universities there, this is kind of a list of the very specific niche of the NEUP program that are funded by my, uh, my program, projects that are funded by my program. You guys are in there. Uh, Dr. Yang has uh, uh, an ongoing NSUF award that has the research part funded by ASI. And then there was a ASI project that is just completing in the mechanical uh, engineering department. I'll spend some time here, maybe because uh, you know I think what's uh, of interest for you is a bit the technologies, right? So there'll be other slides later, you know, discussing some of them. Um, you know, I didn't really know what to expect before I came here, so the slides I obviously prepared them before. Uh, so it's basically my interpretation and four slides that I had already ready. Um, so we can talk about some of the things that are not discussed more in depth, but um, this. You know, just going through this uh, achievements in actually what, what the program has done. We'll start from the from from this last part. Uh, these are uh, a way to measure. Uh, so the problem we wanted to solve here is to measure fuel center line temperature. So fuel pins are normally very easy cylindrical structure with pellets inside the pin and uh, the structure of made of cladding material in essence uh, metal. And then uh, a lot of things happen in the fuel pin. We are testing fuel pins in irradiation experiment essentially to characterize their limits, right? And uh, particularly since the restart of a facility called TREAT, a set, you know, reactor at INL, we have been testing a new class of fuel called accident tolerant fuel that has been uh, one, essentially the biggest effort from the OE in the last 10 years. Uh, once we have concluded the TRISO, we'll get there later. Uh, but uh, so these fuel pins, we are interested in measuring what happens inside. It's obviously a very challenging environment. That's where all the, the flux is. And that's also where all the temperature is at the very center of the fuel. So measuring fuel center line temperature is, has been one of the big challenges. And uh, we have done that by using this modern Niobium junction theses. Molly niobiums are elements that are picked for very low cross section so that the drift due to transmutation is uh, limited, uh, as well as being capable to withstand temperatures above traditional thermocouples. Uh, the combination of high temperature and uh, no drift is a challenge. So what we normally, what industry normally use at high temperature like platinum and so forth, it's no good for nuclear because uh, they drift too fast. 
And then everything else is too low temperature lipotype case that are used for um, say non-core application. So anyway, so this is, these are thermocouples that, that were invented at INL and now they are commercial. Uh, so another success story is that now there is a company that can that has bought our patent and makes them for for whoever needs them. <laughs> Not many people need a, <laughs> this type of products, but they exist. Uh, a second uh, area of work that I will not discuss much later is this linear variable differential transformer. This is something that it obviously is used only for experiments. They're very invasive. They're large. Uh, they're used though for many things. One of the reasons we use them is to measure that second component of what we do for fuel pins, which is to measure pressure. As the uh, material, as the fuel evolves and gets a uh, higher burnout, it releases a lot of fission gases. The cladding has also the function of containing them. So the cladding is where well, you build up a lot of pressure. Measuring that pressure is a very important piece uh, in terms of uh, release uh, term in the case that the cladding gets breached. So if you're melting the cladding, all that gas, of course, is available for release and burst out, highly radioactive. So as a source term, measuring or knowing uh, what's the, the internal buildup of pressure is essential. We measure that by putting bellows, attaching bellows to the fuel pins. And as the pressure, of course, evolves, the bellows expand and this uh, LVDT measures that expansions, which then correlate with pressure. So those are the two things that we use for fuel. Then I have examples uh, here of, of other things at different state of maturity. This acoustic sensor is an interesting piece. Acoustic is a very broad range of technology that you can use to measure just about anything you want. The ultimate uh, is to measure or use them for structural health monitoring. So measuring degradation of materials towards uh, predictive maintenance and so forth. Uh, the easier thing, which is what we have here, <laughs> is to measure temperature. Again, something very interesting. Measuring temperature, this is a commercial, another example of a commercial uh, product. And here they're using a simpler way, a simpler method to create the acoustic wave using PZT materials, uh, uh, actually no piezo material, but not PZT. PZT cannot be used in nuclear because it transmutes really fast. In a couple of minutes, you'll basically uh, degrade it to a point at which it can be used. It also has very low uh, points. Your point for actually behaving as a piezo material. So this is lithium niobate. This is the company that makes them. Well, what you really do is you may send out your your acoustic wave down this waveguide. You measure reflections at either notches or somewhat transition points that you've built in that waveguide, and that reflection time of light you measure temperature average between two reflections. We do that with uh, solid waves. We do that with waveguides that are just very, very thin wires that have different lengths. So you collect the reflection back from the end of each wire. But essentially, it allows you to do multipoint. This is a thick instrument. It's optimized for reliability. We use very much, much smaller cases than the one that we built. And essentially, with the same thickness of a thermocouple, and we use thin thermocouple, 16th of an inch or one millimeter you can collect up to 10 data points instead of the single data points at the thermocouple junction. In addition to that, the waveguide can be anything you want to a certain degree, but it could be tungsten. That means that you can stick it inside, you know, 2000 degree C type elements, so allowing you that, that high temperature. Of course, uh, providing that your transducer at the top has enough delta T to survive. Again, this is a commercial one, lithium narrowbait. We actually use a different class of material. I don't remember if I have a slide on that called magnetostrictive materials. Instead of moving because of an electricity, these guys move because of the magnetic field. And uh, those are much uh, higher red heart, so they can withstand a lot more radiation than the lithium niobate. And that's what we use for in core measure. I will have slides on the FPMD. This is the bread and butter of what we have been doing actually recently. Those are for measuring neutron flux. And then I will have slides on optical fibers and how we want to use them for nuclear systems. Another interesting piece here that I won't discuss further is that at the lower TRL technology readiness level, we're doing a lot of work to trying to use, uh, uh, in so trying to adapt techniques that we use during post-irradiation examination in our larger hot cells. 
Um, so a lot of a lot of the fuel traditional fuel development program go through the cycle of irradiation and PIE. Uh, and then when you take them out, uh, so now your materials have been irradiated and you want to characterize them, you do funny things to them, you reheat them to get back to the high temperature. And some of the things that you do are to you try to back up, for example, thermal conductivity, a very important property of the material as it degrades. So we try to adapt techniques that exist for PIE. Most of them are optics-based, lace-based, so they use free optics and so forth. We try to adapt them in pile because some of the things we want to measure, you need to measure them while they're being irradiated. The thing that, that you can't do during PIE is that you lose a lot of information through the cooling and reheating that you do after. So you essentially re a lot of the defects. So this, uh, this, the optical fiber, the use of fibers has allowed us to transfer some of these techniques in bio. And that's, uh, I won't talk too much about that because there's whole, so that could be many hours discussion. If you're interested, there is actually at INL a specific EFRC, so Energy Frontier Research Center called TETI, T-E-T-I, and is dedicated essentially only to the measurement of uh, material properties and in particular thermal conductivity for materials during radiation. Here's a story that is relevant to, to you, uh, particularly to whoever is interested in, in Polster or uses Polster or wants us to use Polster, which is the idea of why of the irradiation testing, right? So ever since I took on leading this program, uh, at the beginning, I really had to defend why we were uh, catering to irradiation experiments, right? The DOE would say, no, no, all we care is industry partners. We want the industry partners you have to work with their power. And so don't waste your time on irradiation tests. So at the beginning, I had to defend it that I start changing the idea because realizing actually that sticking our stuff in irradiation experiments is the only way we get to mature them, is the only way we get to build a pedigree and, and to inform essentially or reduce, reduce that risk of adoption. And the industry actually bought that, that, that. And so the feedback provided to DOE, and now, now we're okay with that. We don't have to hide behind sort of spending money into instrumenting our irradiation tests. And that's the same reason why we're here now and why Polestar is, is the, we're here to assess whether we can use Polestar as one of our test beds where we build, design sometimes uh, experiments specifically to validate the, the, the technologies, the instrument. Or sometimes we just stick instruments inside piggybacking, as I always say it, and we've done it in treat for a long time. We just stick instruments in the reactor for the first feasibility demonstration. Question? Yeah, I did ask questions. Yeah, 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 all the time. So I just actually had a very interesting experience with the full start where I was able to irradiate instrumentation and actually communicate it with it while it was being irradiated, looking at the test and the stuff I showed you. The coolest level down there. <laughs> we were actually communicating with it, and we were able to work out an experiment with the Pulsar where we were actually able to have uh, electronics active and communicating and testing in real time. It was very cool. My students loved it. It was amazing. That just yeah, pumping yeah. up the Pulsar. So that the type the real time in core measurements is the essence actually of the program yeah. of what the program wants to do. I mentioned we are trying to transfer what we do in PIE into in core, but the other piece is to try to make the most out of whatever in core measurements we are already doing. Normally those are safety related and I don't care about the safety aspect. Advanced reactors hopefully don't need that piece, right? It'll be passively safe. I do care about performance though. And that's what we don't talk about how to use current measurements in reactors for performance, how to use them better and so forth. So yeah, definitely that's what exactly what we do. So in treat, that's what we do all the time. Treat is a pulse power facility, it's an open air core, graphite moderated. And so essentially there are, the cooling channels are open holes. And so up uh, for the last five years, since the treat restart, we've been just dangling instruments out of titanium holders on the top of the core. We had two of the person that worked with me, they just go there on top of the core, they dangle this thing and take it there. That has been extremely successful. It's a fast pulse, millisecond to seconds, depending on who's driving. So there's a project, a program that drives the, the, the experiment of the day, just like in Pulsar. And then we call this concurrent testing because we are doing it concurrently. We don't care about it because we are happy with any type of flux 
any type of pulse shape. We want them all, right? We want to demonstrate that the, the instrument works in all the type of the regimes that you want. So we call them concurrent tests. We don't pay for the experiment. We just give it back. Perfect. <laughs> so that has worked very good. Now, last year, INL, you know, as always, to have everything that is very successful in government gets hit for some reason by over, uh, but, but, but essentially, the more successful you are, the more you have to watch your back. This was extremely successful. So now we're paying the price. The price comes with standardizing configuration management. And with that comes the fact that now our little titanium holders, eh, they can't be 3D printed anymore. They can't be, you know, they have to have pedigree. We need to have drawings. And the funniest thing on this is that I put, let's say, a thermocouple inside an experiment for the drawings that get, you know, through the quality assurance and so forth. The thermocouple is a black box. It's a line. And they're happy with that because it's you know, inside an experiment. If I put now my thermocouple in the cooling channel, now they want the drawing of the internal parts of the thermocouples, which they have used in the same reactor for five years. But now since it's alone, because of this configuration management standardization, I need to provide them formal drawings of the internals, which uh, you know, just from a principal perspective, I just refuse to do. So we're moving away from, from using treat for concurrent testing, at least for this year hoping that there's some sense that follows the, 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 the operation. Yes. But if not, the good part of this will be that we start to use other reactors more and more. This summer, we have used OSURR for tests that we had planned in treats, so for the SPMDs. They allowed us to have very quickly feeding. So an important part for us is like in Pulsar, it would be that we don't care about room temperature or your water cooling temperature. We need to test this stuff hot. So we need to have the capability of putting an active ether inside the reactor without going to, through much trouble of the sample and the safety analysis. OSURR has a lot of flexibility in that sense. They had done it in the past. And so we went to them. This year, we want to make a broader assessment of all university reactors capability along with, with other national labs. That, uh, and RAD is the Triga at INL. Same story. We are happy to use it, but the configuration management is still trying to understand if we have to go through the same process that it is for treat. So, um, so I think that's really the, that, of course, ultimately, the beast is, uh, is, is ATR. This is also why we're here. Joe is designing uh, a test for fuel development that goes inside ATR. ATR is a powerful machine. It does essentially 10 life, 10 years of, of TWR's operation in about three cycles, about nine months. Everything gets cooked violently inside ATR, gets handled violently inside ATR. It's all violent about ATR, but uh, it's a great place for, do your, for doing your lifetime type of characterization for reliability. It's a horrible place for feasibility assessment, right? Because there's so many ways that you can break whatever you put in there that, uh, it's too hard to understand why it didn't work. You're sure that it won't work at the first time you put it in. <laughs> you just not don't know why it didn't work. So this is an important part. It's, it's fun for all of you, I think, to think that that I you know, and it's encouraging to 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 know that we can come here and and do have students involved in testing this this instrument. So the next uh, slides. Uh, yeah, I can talk for hours, I really can. Yeah. So I'll go fast through this. Focus here, so these are the three areas, let's say. Sensors for irrigation experiments are the ones that there's no chance they can go in a reactor, essentially because they're large and invasive, like LDDPs. Then everything else get bin in sensor that we use for irrigation experiments, but potentially, you know, developers can consider for their uh, demonstration plants. Maybe not the commercial part, right? Hopefully in the commercial plant, you don't need to have uh, you know, specific local measurements of flux. But for demos, you need same story as with Fusion. A, a demonstration machine will be very different than your commercial one, hopefully. Otherwise, your, your business case is completely wrong. Right? So, so but, but demos will need these sensors. And the last part that I'm not going to talk about is the controls piece, or which now we call census integration, digital twin, and so forth. Uh, that's something new. And so, you know, we're not really ready to to define or we don't have achievements, let's say, in that space is still LWRS work mainly uh, related to existing plants. 
SPNDs, I want to talk a bit because those are something we tested at OSU, as I mentioned, and the testing of neutron flux is actually the first thing that you would want to bring to a reactor, right? Uh, neutron flux sensors in the lab are not so interesting. <laughs> they won't respond. Hopefully, we don't have neutrons running around in our, in our lab, so uh, we can't do much other than eating them and just uh, maybe do x-ray scanning to see how we fabricate these things that they are they're proper. Uh, but you know, in order to test the performance, we need neutrons. So, so that's of course something we would be willing to to to, to test in Polestar as well. SPNDs are uh, the name says self-powered neutron detectors. Uh, there is an emitter, and the emitter is coated with some material that uh, say rhodium traditionally for steady state. And then what we have done, we have uh, developed and then. Uh, demonstrated the use of gadolinium for transient. That's what we needed in treat. Treat, again, millisecond pulse, so rhodium is a slow decay, and so rhodium would measure only steady state. Uh, gadolinium does it for your millisecond pulses quite nicely. Some results here. This is actually the steady state phase uh, measuring the facility that's called ATRC. This is a trigger that has the same core configuration, and we use it for uh, essentially doing demonstration of validation of NCMP calculation before stuff goes in ATR. So we have uh, used them to, ah, too long of the story, to characterize the different core configuration. Here's treat and here is the gadolinium responding to the different treat pulses. So these are the interesting different tailoring of the energy we can deposit in treat from again milliseconds to the very long very, very long for three, three, three second pulses of, of energy. That's the look at the reactor and here's what an SPMD really is that that emitter gets coiled normally to allow for enough material or enough current to be, to be uh, collected. Um, I don't think I have a slide on fusion chambers, right? So I don't know if there's any questions on the neutron flux. There's other ways to measure neutron flux. The next little step beyond SPNDs is the fission chamber is essentially a similar concept, normally coaxial, uh, but it's preamplified. So now the signal is amplified, which the other thing is that fission chambers normally use a fissionable material. And by using a combination of uranium-235 and uranium-238, you also get an idea on the spectrum. So between thermal and say fast, fast for, Fusion pass, <laughs> not not a fusion pass, but uh, so allow you some spectral characterization. We do use fusion chambers. Uh, they are, and all this stuff is commercial. At this point, you buy SPNDs from Miriam. You guys know because you're actually calibrating. I heard uh, a near, Miriam materials pulsar. Uh, you buy a fusion chamber from a company called Photonis, which is a spin off of CA in France. Uh, they're kind of the only provider, so it's a very small market again, but they're commercial. All right, let's keep going. And I will talk fast through the optical fiber unless I see people jumping out of excitement because I can talk a lot about optical fibers. Uh, I've been insisting and I, I, I put my, you know, my reputation behind the fact that we should be using optical fibers in, in nuclear. Uh, when I came in, the, the idea was, no, it's impossible. No, they dark. That was the mantra. They dark. They do dark. So obviously you don't want to use visible. You don't have to use visible light in optical fiber. That's the worst. And in any case, light that you want to use fibers. Um, the other thing is that these are standard fibers that you, you'll see everywhere, right? The communication fibers. That's also the worst material you can use with. It's the germanium dope cladding that does the color centers, which leads to darkening. So just use different materials. So just that, that idea of using pure silica core, fluorine doped uh, uh, cladding created a new class of commercial materials. Now, if you go on some of the fiber vendor sites, you see red, red heart fibers, which are essentially, the companies had them forever. They didn't know what to do with it. Nobody bought them. And then since we started using them, now they define them as red hard fibers. They behave much better towards the first piece, which is RIA. In any case, you don't want to deal with R. The way to not to deal with RIA is to use frequency. So you in nuclear, you don't want to use intensity-based measurements. You have to stay away from that no matter what. Even if they don't become dark, they still 
uh, reduce uh, your your intensity, your attenuation. So Raman backscattering, anything that is based on measuring light intensity, you need to stay away from. But if you move, if you use frequency, you don't have the problem until you collect some light. So now that becomes your your end of life is when the fiber is so dark that you you had your, your your floor noise is all you measure. But that's really like a, a end of life. So APR does that. <laughs> Anything you put in APR at a certain point dies. Even in that case, even in that case, the point is you should use fibers. If you have three months lifetime out of, of the optical fiber, you, you may be able to collect all that you need from the fiber, right? Because your startup process may have enough of, of even steady state and transients and maybe accident conditions. Fibers are very, very you know, light to your design, to your they, they, you can have a fiber sitting there forever. It doesn't really matter, right? So even in that case, there you have a case. But if you use frequency, you will collect a lot of information out of the type, out of the fiber. So if you use frequency, though, you still have issues. And the issue is decalibration because of essentially compaction of the glass. This is a way that we are hoping that we can get rid of decalibration. Whatever scheme you use to measure uh, your phenomena in the fiber, whether it's a grading, whether it's distributed measurement, the idea behind the fiber is that you can put a lot of sensors along the fiber length. The idea here is that one of these sensors, the first one, is actually a calibrating cavity. It's not really a sensor. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, physics and optics behind this, but the idea is that if you use this uh, void that you have created inside the fiber to measure the compaction, and then you use that as a compensation tool. At this point, you have a real-time compensation, so you, you know, the signal that you drag out is compensated for compaction, and you don't have that drift going on. This we are testing is inside many reactors, and uh, hopefully we are, uh, we will be soon coming up with this, uh, you know, process to use this to, to, to perform that compensation. Another way, a reason to use fibers, I showed you before that material type testing where we use, use the fiber only as a wave guide, as a light guide. There it was to bring the laser in and out while the material was oscillating. Here is standard pyrometry. So the fiber here is used to look at the surface. It has a 45 degrees cut and the fiber looks at the side of the cladding. And now you measure cladding temperature right before essentially the cladding explodes because in treat the cladding literally explodes and you measure that temperature right before you breach it. We found out that we were using small, tiny thermocouples attached to the cladding. A tiny thermocouple will not have heat, uh, you know, it will not re remove heat through conduction at steady state, but during that millisecond transient, it is a significant thin effect. So now that we start to use pyrometry, we realize that the cladding temperature we were measuring were, were actually 200 degrees off. We were talking high temperature, 1600, 1800 C, but we, they were 200 degrees off. And that's 200 degrees of conservativeness you put in your regulatory uh, cladding approval, right? So, so that's big, you know, that's, that's an example of how the nuclear industry has to go through all this over conservatism because you, it's very hard to measure things and when you measure them with, with uncertainties, you always have to take that super high conservatives out of, you know, into it. And if you do me better measurements, like in this case, you know, now you, you can use that material for 200 degrees more, which means you can push your end and so forth, right? That translates into costs or... I don't know, how much do you care about fibers? <laughs> but... The next step is instead of using point measurement, you use distributed temperature measurement. So here is an example of how that's done. Optical frequency domain replicometry. It's basically a monopoly of a company called Luna, uh, Luna Innovations. They provide the interrogator that does this stuff. It costs uh, 200K for an R&D unit that is a bit more intelligent, 80K for the stupid version that only has, you know, that doesn't allow you to change parameters and when it stops working, for example, because it's too hot, it stops working, it just hits you out in error. But it's really cool technology. Here, you, you sweep into the frequency, so you pay a price in terms of uh, time. You have to integrate through the whole wavelength that you're using, so it takes about 10 seconds, uh, 12 seconds. So you get a data point every 10 seconds now. 
You can push it to two seconds, depending on, but anyway, you sweep through frequency, you collect that holes, and that's the signature that you get through the whole fiber. That fiber can be a kilometer. They use it in mines, for example, to detect methane leaks. They're up to 10 kilometers, one sweat is 10 kilometers long. And then you just look at the signatures. If there's a ping, so if there's a, a difference, essentially, that you collect, then you do frequency to time, time of flight, and you go and pinpoint where that leak is or where that, that over signal was. We do the same with temperature, and now we build temperature maps, as you see there, for example, of this heat. This is what we are selling as to, to, to advanced reactors for temperature mapping. If you move on to, and instead of having one data point at the core outlet, now you have a map of the core in terms of temperature. What can you do with it? I don't know, it's not my job, right? That's the question we're asking the designers, but that's something that, that I'm interested also in discussing with, 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 with you guys, for example, to design experiments in Tulsa. That's what Constantin is interested in, in terms of validating these core models. Like, what can you do if, if, I, if you can do temperature mapping, 3D temperature mapping, right? And what you do with that information is, a, is, is, is an important question that, that we are going for trying to address. Here is a bit of everything else. Uh, that's a, a pressure sensor example. Another way to use optical fiber. We discussed it yesterday. I don't remember where or when or why. I remember when and where, but I don't remember why. <laughs> Yes, the, an easier way to again it's a one point measurement, but you use the optical fiber to build an interferometry pattern. And as the diaphragm is moving because the pressure of that interferometry pattern changes, again, another uh, wavelength based measurement, the peak of the interferometry shifts. And, and so, this is an easy way to, to measure pressure. There's another of this, you know, again, the, the fiber just has to continue transmitting light throughout operation. We are, oh yeah, that's why, because that's the part that we are including in Joe's uh, test. <laughs> yeah, and that's why one of the reasons we were here uh, to, we are promoting that and BWXT is uh, considering including that in their small, uh, in the micro reactor, which is a helium uh, coolant. And so they care about uh, local pressure, right? For example, to look at channel blocking. So that's the acoustic sensor. I talked about it before. Here's the transducer coil with magnetostricting material. Here are some of the examples of the different type of uh, waveguides that you can use. Here's a thermocouple. I think I did talk about this before. So again, 1600C. I want to talk quickly about the fusion stuff. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll go through this. But this is important because we just uh, toured the additive manufacturing <laughs> facility. So in terms of additive manufacturing, the key for us is to be able to print ceramic. So and that's for conformal, uh, to allow for conformal sensing. So we need to learn to take what you guys are already doing with metals, but then we need to print ceramics on top of metals and they need to be stable as, you know, to temperature, thermal fatigue. And then we need to print other metals on top of the ceramics sitting on the metal. So that's, uh, that's the three layer step. And that uh, what we are working on some of these pieces, I don't want to pay for the ceramic part. I think that's you know a lot of programs, a lot of industry, a lot of areas have an interest there. Uh, we are developing the inks, the right inks for the sensor piece, and so that's 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 really what we are we are working towards for that third layer. But we need to rely on others to do the, the ceramic part because that's a very complex uh, problem. We are using that for strain gauges. And that's kind of the first application in part because uh, it's very hard to find the strain gauges. Otherwise, they would work at temperature and radiation. They're very bulky. And here is something we just talked about before, uh, Red Heart Electronics. Uh, we were just discussing the fact that you can take conventional uh, CMOS uh, and, and do something to them, seal them essentially to, so that they can operate in certain condition. But if we're talking about inside the vessel, that's not uh, what you can do. JFAT is a commercial technology at low temperature. It could work. So we're building some, uh, just as an example, uh, an analog to optical transducer based on JFAT, conventional JFAT silicon. Uh, but then there's the, the, the opportunity to use different materials and build JFATs out of gallium nitride. That's what Oak Ridge is looking at. 
and gallium oxide. And that's what Dr. Yang is looking at uh, for high temperature and uh, harder uh, radiation environments. So that's what I had on the sensor and I'm done. Look at that. <laughs> so I don't know, let's, let's, let's see if there's some question. Otherwise for 10 minutes, I can talk about fusion. Any question? And I'll censor that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's go. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so your LVDT can use the, in the, like the, the reactor. Yeah, so LVDTs are used in industry. If you just buy one off the market, no. But there's a, a company, this is actually a reactor in Norway, it's called the Halden. So the Halden is actually the location. For 30 years, they have been very, very specialized into building radiation hardened LVDTs. Okay. So what's the pipe about that? Different side, they they vary, but essentially they are you know half inch minimum diameter, so, but then bigger, and they need to have length of course to have the three coils, so from three to five inches far. So, so a little bit thinner than this. So they're large in terms of so the real estate inside the core of our inside our our irradiation test is extremely expensive. We stick our experiments inside channels, inside this, you know, ATR beasts or, or others. But in essence, we need to work within one inch. So when we have the luxury of a two-inch channel, is like where we are. You know, that's where we we can really get go on on design and stuff, right? But most of the times, we need to put things in that are essentially a millimeter size. So for us, LVDTs are extremely large. They, they're, you know, you need to design around the LVDT rather than, you know, sticking an instrument in an already designed experimental component. But they do withstand core, uh, you know, conditions. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. My question is about the kind of reliability. What can you say about the reliable property sensors when it comes to the kind of harsh environment that we do about it, the beta, beta? I can only say bad things about that. <laughs> <laughs> so we went through that because now we're working for a program called uh, Fission Surface Power, which is the idea of building a reactor for the moon. Obviously, this is an unmanned reactor. It's supposed to work for 10 years. And you don't want to have an astronaut having to go there and fix it. So there are reliability, reliability, reliability. Well, that's a problem, right? So Joe knows well that we put essentially 50 thermocouples in one of our experiments, you know, nominally, hoping that one of them survives at the end. So that's the reliability data that you have there. Obviously not something that we can sell to industry. So in terms of reliability, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. Again. Our main constraint is real estate. And so the thicker you thermocouple you use, the, the better it will survive. You know, only so you need to be really be constrained to use the type of instrumentation that we do. But you know, the, the core is the core, it doesn't really matter. Even a commercial or what you use for the moon will still have the same constraint. You cannot put a three to five millimeter thermocouple, 50 of them, now you come out with a bucket. You know, and that's a, that's how you build a fusion system. All of a sudden, it becomes like a you know a gigantic multi billion dollar thing because uh, you need to have you know, all these neutrons. So the diagnostics for the fusion system, each of them is an experiment on its own, right? The, the fusion system it explodes. So we don't want to build cores that way. Therefore, our thermocouples will continue to be extremely small, and the reliability will continue to be an issue. No doubt there. So not. Not very much data to answer, though, for in, in terms of providing, you know, a risk assessment or or RAMI type assessment. Very very challenging. All right, I'm starting going back to work on fusion mainly because DOE has decided to follow the same idea for the ARDs, so this advanced reactor demonstration. Let's stop sending money to the lab. They waste it. They get people to travel around. University that's not that. So let's just put money into industry and then the labs will have to go and fight with industry to get a piece of it. That's the idea behind that. Fusion has decided to do the same thing. So just uh, actually 10 days ago, the last weekend, came out with surprise everyone with this call. It's the beginning, a lot less money than in Fusion. In Fusion, we're talking 500 million. Here, we're talking 50 or 25 for next year. And it's designed, well, in Fusion, we're building demonstration plants. In Fusion, we're just going to be doing design. 
but that's the same idea. They're selling this to these new industries that are saying that in 10 years they can build a fusion reactor. So it's a good idea though, but let's, let's, let's give it a try. Let's have them showing really what they're up to, right? Instead of just keep saying it. So, so it's a good idea. So, you know, a lot more interest now in fusion from, from, from everywhere, from commercial or not. So it's, uh, unfortunately this presentation has got all the little, so I'll have to stay here forever. <laughs> and we'll go faster that on what fusions uh, has achieved. Uh, not much to tell you the truth. Uh, uh, so we have two facilities uh, essentially uh, that have achieved or, or used uh, tritium, which is really what you need in order to claim that you can heat the plasma itself, right? Otherwise you just keep using electricity generated possibly by fission, it's a good thing, but uh, you're still using electricity, a lot of it to actually do these experiments. Two facilities that use tritium, TFDR, which is actually almost gone now in terms of memory, but that was really the facility. Uh, and then JET, which has continued doing that. Uh, and just last year completed their second cycle of DT experiments. Um, then there's a lot of other uh, valuable plasma physics experiments like D3D, uh, but uh, those are essentially plasma physics experiments. I don't talk much about NIF. That's also not a fusion machine. That's a weapons testing. Um, yeah, that's I mean, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. also called weapons testing. Exactly. So, but in fusion, what you need, you need fuel. So not so different, right? Than, than a fission plant in reality. If you, if you are not a plasma physicist, you need fuel, you need confinement, you need heat, and then you need all your systems around and you see the scale of this beast. Uh, I'll have to go fast through this, but uh, uh, what's the fuel for fusion? Everyone says it's water, right? And it's some um, component. The fuel for fusion is lithium. Lithium is what generates tritium to breeding. So what you put into the machine is lithium. By the way, lithium is probably the worst thing you want to compete on right now because of the batteries. Right? So, so that is bad, bad, bad. But that's the reality of fusion. You're using lithium and not water. Uh, you use water in part, <laughs> the deuterium, so the heavy part of water, you mix it with tritium that you generate from lithium, and you get a lot of neutrons out of it. So that is your fusion machine. A uh, nuclear facility. I don't know how much you want to know about this. You need to push this thing to a point, and the most interesting thing is to consider this piece, you know, the famous loss on criterion. You need to get that number high and you can do it by balancing these three parts, time, temperature, and density. So you can focus these things very much. That's what NIF does. That's what the, uh, you know, uh, ignition type or inertial fusion does. It just collects or compresses this stuff to very high density for a very, very short time. Or you can expand that time to things that are not as dense, which are plasmas confined by magnetic uh, fields. And that's, that's what ITER does over my magnetic confinement machines. Um, this is again another picture of JET to give you the size. And this is the experiment in which we have first tritium. And this is the bigger side machine that is being built uh, in south of France, in Canada, near the CEA uh, Research Center. This is what I've worked for you know, seven years of my life before coming back to the US and taking on the instrumentation program. So, to you need to notice that there is an even standard size person all the way on the right, typically. Yes. It's about one meter and eight, about six feet tall, so it's six feet there. So it's interesting that you don't even see it actually from your hand. <laughs> I have some more picture of the heat in the park. So all the stuff around it all is what I mentioned before, right? All that stuff is needed to, to get this, this system to work. And that's why the system becomes so large and so expensive. Here's why we need to use DT. So, so that's, uh, you probably understand cross sections being nuclear engineers. So uh, this is log, unfortunately, we will all hope that will be later, but it's not. Uh, so credible path for now is DT to be realistic. There's companies pushing for this uh, uh, proton boron uh, reactor reaction for confinement, only one. And then there are companies that are still talking about amyotron fusion. In reality, that's always the, the, the say, you know, uh, objective or long-term objective. You use DT and then possibly you get to a point in which you're so good at your, your that you have 
you can do it with DB, where you wouldn't have neutrons coming out. At that point, your, your technology needs to be at a level anyway, then you won't probably continue to use DT, but it's okay. So this is what tritium is. I'm sorry, I didn't introduce that part, but I think all of you all know about isotopes like me. Uh, let's take a look at the real. <laughs> That's okay. You will know what the plasma is. You strip electrons, and then you have uh, essentially uh, electrically sensitive uh, particles uh, can be trapped by magnetic fields. Here is just uh, the cool part that I wanted to talk about: the accelerator, uh, because when we talk about advanced manufacturing. So in reality, if you the confinement that you can do, so at the beginning in the 50s, it was like, oh, that's easy. You know, we can just do a toroidal configuration and just, just trap the particles just simply you building a toroidal field. This. Then they started to look at that and the situation is a lot more complex. The combination of toroidal and poloidal, which you see here, is what defines the tokamak, it's essentially the Russian word for, for it. That's also not enough, unfortunately. So that's what it is now. So there's a lot of other coils that need to go in there. D3D worked actually on removing part of this and then stabilizing that with in, in, inside coils, but essentially they need to be stabilizing coils inside. The main reason is that what this configuration likes to do is it likes to keep it confined for a while and then it disrupts. So this major disruption, actually jet is a very interesting story, but when they first operated jet at, at high power, uh, jet had a major disruption that lifted the whole thing. I mean, you saw the man standing inside there, lifted that whole thing by about four centimeters from the floor. The whole thing just whoo, went up and oh, it just went down again. So that was the first major disruption. It's like, oh, this is major. <laughs> oh, no, no, no more of that. So in order to avoid having this major disruption where you dump all the energy all of a sudden, you actually go through a cycle of minor edge disruption. So you, you superimpose essentially frequency, small disruptions all the time so that you don't have that type of large accumulation of energy that dissipates all at once, so, which is bad for your machine. Complication of that, that you need to stick a lot of side, a lot of stuff inside this, uh, this coils addition to that. That's what DPD has been leading for, for many years now is how to configure this for us in order to, to have this uh, say, that small disruptions dominate. This is a cool thing, which is again, the plasma is not heating itself uh, yet, right? So we need to provide a lot of heat to that. You see the size of this components, right? I say this is a reactor on its own. So there are different ways to measure to heat the plasma. The easier one, we all thought that would work and we would be done is RF. Can't do it that way, unfortunately, it's not enough. So now nothing goes through these large magnetic fields if you're trying to eject stuff if they're not neutral beams. So this is a, an amazing, stupidly idea of, of creating charged particles in, in ion beams and then neutralizing them just because they have to go through the magnetic field. And then as soon as they hit the plasma, they are stripped again and they are used to actually heat the plasma. Really complex stuff. Just the accelerator itself is, is its own projects. Of course, the Italians have jumped on it and they have built that. <laughs> it's like, perfect, it's an experiment for you. you know, so, they're building these guys, and I don't remember how many of these there are either. I think there was three of them. Two at the start. Yeah, and then one to add. If they can afford it. <laughs> it's a one MEV accelerator. So this is how you heat the plasma. You take it up to that NT time uh, confinement. Then you can actually reach a state in which the plasma self-sustains and heats itself. Okay. It's fine. So I think uh, why fusion? I don't know. I think Florian has to answer that. So in the next seminar, Florian will answer the question of why we want to be fusion. Why not? <laughs> so it's super cool. That's what, uh, from a student perspective, that's what you, what you should be looking at. It's, it's actually the physics of fusion are amazing. You, you, the combination of materials and plasma physics and everything that you need to do is just, it's just a, you know, a unmatched in my opinion. That's why I started with fusion to do my PhD. There are reasons, though. I mean, you know, the promise, and you know, joke, jokes aside, there, there's, there's a lot that fusion can promise in terms of uh, energy security. Um, let's not talk about waste. That's that's a big conversation to have. Uh, a, a DT fusion machine generates about a lot of neutrons, so the reality, the machine gets activated. Uh, it's all secondary radiation at that point, but it really depends on the structure material that you can use. 
if you use conventional structured materials, you still end up with a very, very hot machine after you operate it for a while. So fusion community is looking at reduced activation for the martensitic steel for that purpose. Uh, however, then none of this is yet qualified. So that's like why every time we hear this company saying that they'll build a fusion reactor in five years, we all kind of say, well, with what? That's, uh, so lot, lot and long discussion. Um, but yeah, of course, the energy promise, you'll understand that, that in terms of yield and how much energy you can use. This, uh, I just want to show you the, oh yeah, these are a bunch of cool pictures of uh, including the 3D. It's up here in San Diego. You should all take a bus. You should organize a bus. And I'll go to San Diego. It's a fantastic place. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic place to be. The General Atomics campus in La Jolla is, you know, top-notch in terms of where you can be as to do experiments. Uh, there's others. Uh, Japan has a couple of also nice facilities. I like to spend time. This is the big machine, right? So that's why I didn't put the man before because this is better. You can see the size and you know you, you can just go eater.org and you can see all of this. It's uh, obviously very, very much advertised. Here's the your man there. Oh, here too. So I was working on this little guys that go in here. This little things, they're called test blanket modules. This machine is a gigantic waste of energy. All the heat that is generated is dissipated in water blankets. So the water just cools it down because they don't want the heat in essence. But of course, a reactor would have to use the heat. And so they're trying technologies in this little cassettes here that represent essentially the well, how you would generate tritium to breed it and how you would remove the heat to generate the other trees. Test blanket models. Optimism, those are all the companies that we are discussing for this ARD. Just go on this, uh, it's called uh, Fusion Industry Association. Just click it and you go to members and then you get this page and then you can go into their, their, their web pages and look at all the promises they give you. Some of them are, so this is what I wanted to show for some of the advanced manufacturing tools. So I was describing that the accelerator is a super cool thing because when you take the toroid field, right? Now you know that the, the, the tokamak field, which is rather simple, is not working. So what you need to do is you need to add things inside magnets, inside the core, to actually twist the field horribly so that it's stable. That is the result. So, so when you look at the toroidal field, the way that, you know, it's simple, the way that it really wants to be is this. And the accelerator idea is you take that twisted stuff, you build it that way, you build the magnets that way in that twisted configuration where the plasma wants to be, and then it's stable. And so, and they're building machines like this. When well designed in Germany, it's actually built, it's operating, it's crazy. So don't do it. But now there's uh, additive manufacturing. So maybe we can do it. So that's why I like Stellarage, because additive manufacturing could be a solution for building this very, very intricate stuff. And if you could figure out how to print the magnets, so use the magnet relevant materials uh, to, to actually and print them in this distorted configuration, uh, maybe, maybe it would work. Maybe this is the first step. I don't know. Maybe this is the first step. That's what uh, probably the most advanced, the comp there's a company that has actually been used as the target for the money that I discussed before. It's called Commonwealth Fusion System out of MIT. Uh, that's what they're selling, a much smaller configuration called spherical torus. Uh, many of the problems are similar though. Another idea, and I, I go through this just so that I can stimulate your inventiveness, is that if I could have, instead of a solid wall, a liquid wall, that would allow me for many, many things. You know, For one thing, I don't have the wall problem that it gets damaged by disruptions and so forth because the, the liquid uh, circulates. And, but also, if I use lithium, then it's, it's a fantastic material. It's a soft material to have at the site. The, the plasma loves to have lithium. Uh, tungsten is what we use now. And that's already too heavy. Every time you have some of the tungsten going back in the plasma, it cools it down. The plasma essentially loves to be hydrogen. Anything heavy you put in the plasma, it weighs it down. <laughs> so lithium is good. It's good. 
Uh, using lithium is a problem, right? Lithium is bit like sodium is reactive to oxygen and so forth. Uh, but that's good. Uh, so interesting physics and interesting uh, interesting engineering. So another idea, some of the companies as you go through, you'll scroll, you'll see magnetized target fusion, an in-between thing between magnetic and inertial confinement. And the compact is, so the, the spherical torus is one, there have been other uh, examples of, of, of compact fusion. We already discussed the fuel, the promise of non-neutron fusion uh, is by using DD essentially, in this case also proton born. You don't have neutrons, you don't have activation, it's a lot simpler. And then finally, yeah, this I already discussed. I wanted to have the final slide. Uh, it's not mine, so I don't take responsibility for that. But uh, the, the back to the future, you know, there was a fusion reactor in the car. And then there's cold fusion. Cold fusion is, you know, <laughs> So you can take it with whatever, however you want to interpret it. But the physics behind it is, is, is extremely interesting. I really like the, yeah, I wish I could have understood both ice and condensation, then I would not have become an engineer. But unfortunately, when I tried it, it was just beyond me. And I decided that nuclear engineering was better prospect for me. But. So that's, that's your fusion slides. Uh, I don't think there's any time for questions. But I already went over it. But if you have any questions, uh, <laughs> right. thanks a lot. <laughs> I know we run out of time uh, a little bit, and the uh, let me take a quick take a look at uh, on lunch if we have any. Yeah, I think that we are good. And uh, if you, you know, you have uh, Patrick's contact information. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. 